let's explore the origins of Ganesha and explore why he got an elephant head. Let's talk about the name Ganesha or Ganapati. The word literally means a leader of a troop or a band. In the Rig Veda, the word was used just like that, not referring to a deity. For example, in Rig Veda 2.23.1, we see this. We invoke the Brahmanaspati, chief leader of the bands, a sage of sage, abounding beyond measure in every kind of followed, best lord of prayer, hearing our invocations. Come with your protections and sit down in the chamber of sacrifices. Translation by Wilson. Rig Veda 10.110.9, it's used in a similar context. You can read it for yourself. Pause the video. Now let's move on. To understand the Vinayakas, let's examine the beliefs of South Indian tribes. In Tamil Nadu and Kerala, there's a belief that a class of spirits called Peyi possesses people and must be exercised. The aim is a dance in which the spirit enters the host's body. In Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, mainly in the rural areas, there's a belief that spirits, especially those that died of disease or in other ways, especially unnatural deaths, will possess people and cause general misfortunes like disease or cattle dying. These spirits need to be appeased and they're worshipped as gods and sometimes they're exercised. The Gauns are a central Indian tribe and they believe that everything has spirits and spirits dwell everywhere and influence their lives. They can be benevolent or malevolent and there are some dances and rituals to exercise or appease these spirits. The people of Tulunado have a similar ritual to Tayam called Bhutakola in which spirits enter the dancer's body and spirits need to be appeased. Now let's look at the spirit worship in the context of Vedic period. In the Ayurvedic Sanskrit text, there are grahas like Skanda alongside Vinayakas that are spirits that cause disease and other calamities. For example, below in the Sushruta Samhita chapter 7 of the Uttara Tantra, you can see descriptions of the grahas pertaining to Skanda. Grahas are disease-causing spirits. If you look at my video on the origin of Murukan, you can learn more. Essentially, the worship of the brothers Skanda and Ganesha originated from the appeasing of spirits during the ancient period. Now, let's look at some textual references to the Vinayakas. The early reference to the Vinayakas are found in the Manavagraha Sutra, a text on household rituals. This text dates to the end of the Vedic period. It is in the text in the Vinayaka Kalpa in which they are found for the first time. From this text, we can see that unlike Ganesha of today, the Vinayakas were creators of obstacles rather than removers. What I'm saying is that there's a very, very old animistic belief that there are spirits that influence the lives of people and need to be appeased. This tribal belief must have been inherited into modern Hinduism. Those possessed by spirits in general are said to act crazy and or mad. The Vinayakas are a class of spirits which texts like the Mahabharata put them on par with Bhutas and Pisachas that are mischievous and at times malevolent. Let's look at a passage from the Manava Griha Sutra. Translation by me. Now hence we shall explain the Vinayakas, Shalakuntaka and Kusmandaraj Putra and Ushmita and Devayajana thusly. With these of those that which are acquired, these ones become clawed and clay grown extremely. My guess is it's the people that become clawed and clay grown. Symptoms of being under the influence of Vinayaka include absent-mindedness, depression, a prince will not have a kingdom, a girl will not find a husband, a woman won't have children, and if the person is a student, they won't learn well. A merchant won't receive any profit. This is in line with the role of the Vinayakas being creators of obstacles, but as their cult grew, they consolidated into one and they became removers of obstacles. The Ajnavalkya Smriti dating to like the 2nd century AD, we have the Vinayakas being condensed into four Vinayakas, but in this text, the Vinayakas are said to be manifestations of one Vinayaka. Now, this is found in chapter 2, verses 271 to 294. Now, this is one of the earliest times we see the Vinayakas being a class of spirits to a single deity. You can think of this Vinayaka as a proto -Ganesha. Text also has the Vinayaka Shanti and an explanation of how to pray to and appease the deities. They are free from one's possession.
So are these uh, spirits and by extension Vinayaka or Ganesha Indo-European or non-Indo-European? Well, we have the offering of fish, which is meat. And since these were offered to the Vinayakas, we can tell these are non-Vedic. Of all the Vedic rituals relating to spirits and disease, all offerings and items were plant-based and there was no meat offerings used. There is one case where a animal skin was used to make a pouch for amulets that containing herbs, but in general, no meat offerings were used. On the contrary, Dravidian and Austroasiatic rituals use meat. And the way in general the Vinayakas are appropriated, such as use of pots with clay, kind of resembles the non-Vedic pattern of worship. So we can conclude that Ganesha, like his brother Skanda slash Murugan, is non-Vedic, maybe tribal or Dravidian in origin. In the Yajna Valky Smriti, we have the Vinayaka Shanti. In chapter 9, it says, Vinayaka has been appointed for the purpose of bringing about obstacles in the performance of sacred rites, and he has been put at the head of all the hosts of devas, which are the ganas, by Rudra and Brahma, as well as by Vishnu. So here we actually see something interesting. We see a single deity called Vinayaka. This is a transition from a class of deities called Vinayaka in the plural. Now this is also interesting because Vinayaka is now the Ganapati or the leader of the hosts. And here, as they always have been, what's interesting is the Vinayakas were obstacles in daily normal life and also in pujas and other sacred rituals. There's also a prayer to Vinayaka now become that is used to uh, deter their effects by appeasing them. This is to make sure the ritual will go smoothly. Now over time, as the cult of Vinayaka grew, he became, rather than a creator of obstacles, a remover of obstacles. And thus, we have the origin of the ritual, where before we start a puja, we worship Ganesha before worshipping any other god. And it begs the question, why is Vinayaka known as Ganapati? Exactly are the Ganas. Well, the Ganas are spirits, and these are said to accompany Shiva. That the Ganas are spirits or ghosts that follow Shiva is supported by this verse in Srimad Bhagavatam 8.2. Having ascended the bull Nandi, the lord of the mountain who is surrounded with all of the band of spirits, along with Devi, which is Shiva's wife, he went to see where Madhusudana was sitting. We know Ganas refer to spirits, and since the Vinayakas, and by extension Ganesha, was a spirit, and the foremost of spirits back then, they regarded Ganesha as the leader of the spirits, or Gananampati, or Ganapati. Now you know why Vinayaka is also called Ganesha or Ganapati. Now let's return to the Ajnavalkya Smriti. So, in verses 287 to 290 of the Yajna Valkyasmriti, ninth chapter, which is also the Vinayaka Shanti, it says to get rid of Vinayakas possessing a person by praying to and appeasing the Vinayaka and as well his mother Ambika. Here we see the idea of Vinayaka being the son of Devi, Ambika's manifestation or directly Devi herself. Actually, Ambika might be a precursor to Uma slash Parvati. We'll deal with Ambika and the origin of goddesses separately in our video explaining the origin of Shaktiism. But we now know where the idea that Ganesha is the son of Shiva and Parvati came from. The notion originated at least 2000 years ago. I do want to reiterate, appeasing the Vinayakas before a puja might be the origin of why we start a puja regardless of the deity with Ganesha. Big question, how did these groups of formless spirits go to a deity with an elephant head, emphasis on the elephant head. Aranyaka 10.1, we have a description of Rudra having elephantine features like a crooked trunk and a tusk, but it seems to be a later addition by those of the Ganapatya cult. This doesn't explain why Vinayaka, who originates from a group of spirits, an abstract concept, to a uh, deity with an elephant head. We know elephants in general were sacred in our Indian culture, and very valued, but let's dive deeper and establish a link. Turns out in Indian culture, it's not unusual that spirits in general are represented as humans with all sorts of animal heads. Now, the Bharatiya Natya Shastra, chapter 23, verse 98, has this. Utas, aka spirits, are known to be of various colors. They are dwarves with odd faces and may have faces of boars, rams, buffaloes, and deer as well. 
Khmer art, which is Cambodian art, yakshas are depicted with heads of various animals. Yakshas are also a class of spirits, by the way, and it's one of those animals is the elephant. It seems natural that since Vinayakas and Yakshas are similar in the fact that they are a class of spirits, aka Bhutas, the Vinayakas would have heads of animals, or at least depicted that way when they are personified. So my point is, since these spirits, such as Yakshas and especially the Vinayakas, were in general depicted with animal heads, just variation that at least one of these Vinayakas would have an elephant head. Now it's likely that the Vinayaka with the elephant head, or Vinayakas in plural, with elephant heads, which then later consolidated into one, were the popular out of these Vinayakas. One solely famous deity with an elephant head. Now that we know the origin of the elephant head, now let's see why the elephant head was the popular one. Now the easiest answer is obviously elephants have a long history with Indian people. But let's see what exactly that might be. Now, we know from carvings on seals that elephants were popular during the Indus Valley civilization. Ivory was a popular item of Indus trade. Go deeper. The big reason pun most definitely intended was that they were known for their size and strength and greatness. Did you know that to get to the leaves on the top, elephants will literally push down the trees? The elephants were used for religious purposes, I mean, they are found in temples, and also they were used in parades, and as just a general means of transport and a source of manual labor. If you ever go to India or Southeast Asia, do not do the elephant rides or elephant tourists. Those are captive animals that need to be free. I digressed. Now, they were also used for war, obviously such that a king's power is measured in the number of elephants he has. The Alexander's army was freaked out when they saw war elephants. These majestic creatures were just simply awesome to the ancient Indians. Some tribes would have animal worship, and surprisingly, elephants were one of the animals in this totemic worship. It seems that elephants being popular and venerated made them a archetype for iconography of various deities and even yakshas and actually the vinayakas with an elephant head would become the popular ones due to the fact that elephants are simply popular it is the elephant headed vinayaka that becomes the representative and the popular one and becomes the ganesha we know and love it's a lot of reiteration about elephants but there are other subtle reasons for example, of the four Vinayakas, one is known as Kushmandaraj Putra. This long name is invoked when someone is possessed of Vinayaka. In Buddhism, Kushmandas or Kush Kumbandas are a class of spirits. The leader is known as Virudaka. Virudaka is one of the guardians of the four directions. He guards the south. In later depictions, Virudaka wears a helmet with the head of a slain elephant. Interestingly, later Puranas mention Ganesha as the guardian of the south. Paksha is a deity invoked when someone is under the possession of a Vinayaka. Virupaksha is also a name of an elephant that is said to hold up the earth. He guards the west. In Buddhist mythology, Virupaksha guards the west. Though he isn't depicted as an elephant here, he's called the Lord of Nagas, meaning snake. Naga can also mean elephant. These are the Diggajas. Apparently, the Diggajas uh, share some uh, name features with some of the Vinayakas related figures. That might be a subtle reason. Next, in the Mahabharata, Sabha Parva 10.5, Yakshas are mentioned to have arrived in Yudhishthira Sabha. One of them is Dantin, literally means one with a tooth or one with a tusk. Come back to the spirits being depicted with animal heads. In addition to the Khmer art, in a collection of Mathuran art on a frieze, it's number 2335, five Yakshas are depicted with elephant heads. Interestingly, five Vinayakas are mentioned in the Yajna Vilkya Smriti. Kushmanda Rajaputra was actually split into two figures, Kushmanda and Rajputra, and thus you see four Vinayakas become five. These elephant-headed Yakshas were depicted with Kubera, who's a god. So perhaps Ganesha's association with these Yakshas solely because of the elephant head or the spirit nature might have uh, associated Ganesha with Kubera and thus uh, helped elevate Ganesha to the status of a god. However, this is just a hypothesis. The source that might incline people to have depicted Vinayaka with an elephant head is another elephant-headed deity that is Pilusara of Afghanistan. Yuan Siang, I probably pronounced that wrong, in his Buddhist records of the Western world, mentions a mountain in Afghanistan called Mount Pilusara, where the people there worship an elephant mountain spirit. The advent of the Indo-Greeks, Yavanas as we Indians call them, the god Pilusara was identified with Zeus and immediately adopted 
possibly because Zeus and Pilusara were mo both mountain-dwelling deities, possibly to win favor of the local Indians. Looking at Indo-Greek coinage, we can see that the Indo-Greek king wore a elephant-headed helmet, possibly symbolizing that they're under the protection of Pilusara or the mountain deity. A tribe at the time called the Hastikas, possibly due to an elephant cult, it was a warrior tribe. But I want to stress on this point, that Pilusara was not the ancestor to Ganesha. Hastikas and Pilusara was an influence on the ancient Indian uh, mindset to be allowing to depict elephant-headed deities. And thus we do have Ganesha becoming an elephant-headed deity because the odds were in favor of an elephant-headed deity in the first place. Thank you for watching. Now I'd like to conclude. Happy Vinayaka Chaturdi. Happy Ganesha Chaturdi.